SpaceX is inching ever closer to Starship Flight 10. With the modified ship stand now placed on the launch mount, we could be just a few days away from seeing a rollout and static fire test of Ship 37. On top of that, SpaceX looks like they're salvaging some old Starship parts. What's up with that? And given all the activity going around the site, we flew over Starbase this week, and from the air, we spotted important work such as the repair and upgrade work at the Massey Outpost, work on the foundation pilings for the Giga Bay, and loads of progress on the second pad at Starbase. Hi Tech Watchers, I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. It's been a little over a month since Ship 36 exploded just prior to a six-engine static fire test and destroyed parts of the Massey outpost. Let's start this episode by taking a look from above at all the work going on there to rebuild. The first thing to notice is that the crane that fell over a few weeks ago during the cleanup efforts is still on its side. But a couple of cranes can be seen assisting on the lift of the fallen crane, so even though it took a bit of time, it seems like that's either about to be solved or maybe even already solved by the time you watch this. There is another big thing to notice here, and that is that the cleanup efforts seem almost complete. Uh, apart from the Ship 36 remains that fell near the crane and the debris scattered across the moat. Compared to when we last flew over Massey's, which was a few days after the explosion, we can see that SpaceX has put a great deal of work into remodeling the methane tank farm. This tank farm got seriously damaged during the explosion as it was the closest to it, and also several of its components remained burning for hours during the night and the following morning. SpaceX appears to have removed pretty much everything but the two vertical methane storage tanks that were there. Equipment like the prop lines for oxygen and methane, the vaporizers, the pumps, the nitrogen tanks, and even the subcoolers have all been removed. The subcoolers have been moved off next to the Block 3 booster cryostation, which is still under construction. One of the vertical tanks can be seen laid horizontal next to the water deluge tank farm. As we reported on last week's Starbase update, the two other nitrogen tanks, which looked rather sooty, were seen entering McGregor at the end of last week. Now, you may notice that there is a horizontal tank there. That one was actually already at the Massey Outpost for a while, and it's a methane storage tank. SpaceX had already planned some upgrades for this methane tank farm for a while, and, well, I guess now it was the best moment to implement these changes, which includes this new tank. If we look carefully at the work going on at the tank farm, it's really interesting that SpaceX is digging down into the ground for some reason. It's almost as if they want to build or dig something underground. It's also quite interesting that the vertical methane tanks were rotated 180 degrees and there's a square patch of land with rebar near those tanks. Furthermore, it seems like teams are building some sort of wall around something at the location where the communications and control bunker used to be. Now this work is far from complete, but given the stuff we can already observe, it leads us to think that perhaps a lot of the propellant lines that were above ground before might now move underground. The blast wall might also be for a new communications control bunker that is properly protected from any unexpected events at the static fire stand. So given this, it could be that the new configuration will see the pumps and subcoolers on the new square patch, with the methane and oxygen propellant lines going underground. This new configuration would be safer from any unexpected events, as well since it would be slightly further away and have a lot of underground plumbing. If you're wondering about the water deluge tank farm, for the moment it doesn't seem like a lot has changed, if anything at all. It does look like SpaceX put up a new tent at the Massey Outpost though, replacing the one that burned down during the explosion. This time it's further away by the gate, just in case. Having taken a look at the work around Massey's, let's head over to the launch site where SpaceX is modifying Launch Mount 1 to Static Fire Ship 37, the ship that will be used on Starship's 10th flight. You may remember last week's episode that we highlighted the RVEC supports that had been installed on the modified ship transport stand that's going to be used for the static fire. Well, just as we were preparing that episode, teams started installing thick metal plates on each of the openings of the stand. This might be so that the Raptor exhaust doesn't try to escape from there and damage the inside of the launch mount, and probably the Raptor QDs, especially the exhaust from the RVEC engines, which are closer to the exterior. A few days later, we also observed that teams had already installed lifting shackles on top of the stand, so it was clear that the lift was going to happen any day. To prepare the launch mount to receive the modified transport stand, teams performed several modifications to the hold down arms so that it could be installed there. One of those modifications consisted of removing all 20 clamps on the launch mount, each one bolted onto each arm by three bolts. So that means 60 bolts had to be removed. They better have kept inventory of that. With all the clamps removed, the stand can now just rest on the arms themselves. The problem is that without a way for the stand to be fixed to the arms, the ship would just fly off. 
So in order to solve that, it seems like prior to the stand's installation, SpaceX installed a piece of metal that was bolted to each of the arms. The stand could then be welded directly to these metal pieces to make it stay in place. We can in fact see that on our flyover shots that these metal pieces were all installed at the time, just waiting for the stand to be lifted onto the mount. And right as we expected, the giant LR-11000 crane at the launch site moved into place near the launch mount to lift the modified ship stand into place. By the way, some people nicknamed it the star stool, so if you see someone using that word, they're referring to the stand. The lifting operations seemed to go smoothly as usual, and there didn't seem to be any major issues. After the lift was complete, the LR-11000 crane went back to helping the ongoing work at Pad 2, just as usual. Another important piece of work going on at the launch mount is, of course, the connection of many pipes to properly fill the ship before its static fire. Over the last several days, teams have installed more pipes to the top of the booster quick disconnect, but we've also seen other pipes going in other places too. For example, there are a lot of little thin lines that have been installed on the side and over the top of the truss, holding the bigger propellant lines for the ship. It also seems like SpaceX may have installed engine chill lines on the side of the launch mount. The engines are always chilled down before being fired, and that creates a lot of gaseous oxygen and gaseous methane that needs to be dealt with. At Massey's, this was solved by collecting the oxygen and dumping it in a nearby pit while the methane was collected and burned at the covered flare stack on the southeast corner of the site. If I were to guess, these engine chill lines will likely be for the oxygen side as it seems like some of these are plugged into the existing collector for the oxygen side of the booster's engine chill process. But we'll just have to wait and see. So, with all of the work still ongoing, it may be a few more days until it's all finished and the pad is ready to receive Ship 37. We will have to see when a ship quick disconnect plate is installed on the new propellant line at the top of the BQD, since that's probably going to be one of the last steps in the process. Once that's done, it'll probably be around the time when road closures start getting posted on the City of Starbase website. As usual, we'll keep a close eye on all of that, but in the meantime, I wouldn't be surprised if the next Starbase update already contains some of those events I just mentioned. Now, I guess we'll quickly go through some of the frequently asked questions, because there is one question in particular that's most prominent in our videos and live streams. Will SpaceX static fire ship 38 before Flight 10 happens? I mean, it's a fair question, right? They've gone to great lengths to modify the launch mount to be able to static fire a ship. Once Ship 37 static fires, most, if not all of that, has to be taken apart, the hold down clamps would have to be reinstalled, and every pipe and every opening would have to be resealed before Flight 10 happens. Then, after Flight 10, we go back to the same thing, put all the pipes, all of the hoses, all of the bolts, remove the clamps, put the stand on, then do Ship 38 static fire, and take it all apart once more for Flight 11. Wouldn't it just be easier if SpaceX got Ship 38 static fired now, before Flight 10, and not have to go through all that work twice? As logical as this question is, right now we're not seeing any indication that SpaceX may try to do this. For one, Ship 38 has not left Mega Bay 2 for cryo-proof testing, which they often do using the thrust simulator stand at Massey's. This stand has rams that simulates the thrust of Raptors on the aft dome of the vehicle and ensures all of the welds down there are up to spec. SpaceX could just skip cryo-proof testing and go straight to a static fire test, but that would be a risk, and they don't want to damage Pad 1 with an untested ship. On top of that, if they really wanted to test Ship 38 before Flight 10, they should start putting engines on that vehicle, like, now. In that case, they would have time to then take the ship out for testing in a couple of weeks, take everything apart, and still have time to fly Flight 10 in August as targeted. Right now, we've not seen any engines going into Mega Bay 2 for Ship 38, so that scenario is becoming more and more unlikely as time goes on. So far, it seems that SpaceX will static fire Ship 38 after Flight 10, and this may not be a bad thing, in fact. Working on the ground for a few more weeks may be annoying, but on the other hand, SpaceX would be getting valuable flight data, which they could then apply to Ship 38 before it goes into its very own static fire campaign. With the bad run of luck that Block 2 ships have been having, SpaceX is probably not going to miss any chances of doing just that. Speaking of the engines for Ship 38, let's go through our McGregor Minute now because we may have already seen some of that ship's engines at the site. Maybe. Just bear with me for a second and you'll see. This week, SpaceX performed 23 Raptor engine tests at their McGregor Texas engine testing facility. Most of them relight tests, which we'll talk about in a bit. But there were four tests, approximately three minutes in duration, from the Raptor vertical stand, which we may be able to correlate with four distinct RVAC engines seen rolling by our McGregor live cameras. On July 14th, we saw an RVAC 2 going by, and bam, the next day, we got a 190 second burn on the vertical stand. On July 15th, again, another RVAC goes by, the next day we get a 179 second burn on that stand. The same thing happened on July 16th, and then again on July 17th. Four RVACs, four of these roughly three minute long burns on the Raptor vertical stand. Very suspicious. 
And by the way, these are not Raptor 3 vacuums. These look clearly like Raptor 2 vacuum engines. And we got the serial numbers on two of them, one being serial number 483 and the other being 575. Definitely not Raptor 3s. But why do these roughly three minute burns with RVAC engines? Well, it could be that SpaceX is testing these Raptor 2 vacuum engines before being installed on ship 38. It's true that the ship only has three of them, but they may also be testing a few extras and spares. After all, there are no remaining ships after 38 that will be using Raptor 2, either sea level or vacuum. So it's the only reason that could make sense without knowing too much more. Apart from those RVAC tests, we've also seen in recent weeks a few tests that are 140 seconds long from the Raptor South stand, which also happen to be the longest burns we've seen at that stand. It's hard to know for sure, but these could be endurance tests, so to speak, for the Raptor 3 engines that are being tested there. That stand has two different bays, and while those 140 second tests are done in one bay, in the other one it seems like SpaceX has a special engine torture stand. Last week, we already reported some of the Relight testing happening there. But this week, that seems to be continuing as well. The relight tests happened on the 15th, 16th, and 17th, and consisted of an initial 20 second burn, then shut down for a few seconds, then another 20 second burn, then shut down again for a few seconds, another 20 second burn, shut down, and finally another 20 second burn. It almost seems like SpaceX is trying to really nail down the Raptor 3 relight sequence by torturing engines in that bay with relight after relight. Now, one place where we may see more Raptor engines is at the port of Brownsville, or so we think. In the last couple of weeks, NSF has been tracking a very suspicious ship that came into port recently. The ship is called LB Jill and came to Brownsville from Louisiana before then sailing to a location about 11.5 nautical miles off the coast of Mexico, a bit to the south of where Starbase is located. The port documents show that this ship will be carrying, quote, rocket parts, end quote, on it. It almost seems like SpaceX may be using this ship to salvage old Starship parts from the bottom of the Gulf. Correlating the location of this ship with the potential location of debris from prior flights, it seems like it may actually be fishing out the aft section from Booster 13. Booster 13 flew on Starship's sixth flight all the way back in November of last year, and unfortunately, it had to perform an offshore divert instead of landing on the chopsticks. Blame the tower for that, the booster was fine. Right after landing, it tipped over and broke roughly around the common dome. The liquid oxygen tank remained bobbing in the water for several hours and drifted south into Mexican waters, roughly where LB Jill went. So that means we may soon see another Raptor capture from the water, just like when SpaceX recovered Booster 11's engine section in September of last year. Whenever the ship comes back, it will probably be into the port of Brownsville, and you better believe we'll be there to document it. This week, as usual, there was also a ton of progress on several infrastructure projects at Starbase. So let's take a look at those. Thanks to this week's flyover, we were able to spot the work on the foundations for the Gigabay at Starbase. Teams are just getting started, but we can already see the spots where the two transfer aisles will be located through the building. Some of the concrete piles already installed on the side closer to the Star Factory kind of show where the future work cells will be located in that part of the bay. The two drilling rigs at the site are working non-stop to be able to drill the hundreds of piles that will be needed for the Gigabase Foundation. In fact, one could say they might be going a little too fast. This past week, our cameras caught one of the drilling rigs having a bad day when one of its hoses ruptured. Thankfully, teams were able to repair it later and continue using it, but that's not fun. I am sure stuff like this happens on every job site though, but still, not necessarily cameras at every job site. Also from our flyover shots, we spotted parts for a new workstation inside Mega Bay 2. We can see the curved panels at the bottom of it, which are very much similar to the ones on other workstations. Also, you might notice that compared to our previous flyover, SpaceX has completed all the groundwork at Remedios Avenue, and so that means the road can now be used again to drive Starship and Booster down it. In the meantime, SpaceX was bringing vehicles from both bays through the Sanchez lot and then onto Highway 4, which was a much longer trip. Speaking of the Sanchez lot, we can also observe further progress there on the new stands and tooling for the Star Factory that are getting built there. The brand new booster transport stand also received its hold down arms, although it doesn't seem like at the time of our flight, the arms had their clamps attached. However, one place that is starting to receive hold down clamps is the launch mount for Pad 2 at Starbase. That's right, zooming in on our flyover shots, it's clear that at least two of the 20 hold down clamps have been installed on the hold down arms already. Remember that there are two parts here, the hold down arm itself, which is the white grayish colored structure sticking into the launch mount. The other part is the clamp itself that attaches to the booster. Those we can see are in brownish color in this shot. 
During our flyover, we also spotted the progress on the two quick disconnect umbilicals at the Sanchez lot that will be used on the next version of Super Heavy. Unlike the current version of the booster, which loads everything through a single interface, next-gen boosters will have two of those ports, one that will supply liquid oxygen and another that will supply liquid methane. Other commodities will likely be split between one or the other. Compared to the last flyover, both of the QDs at Sanchez had already received all the connecting lines and interface plates had already been installed as well. In fact, a little over a day after we flew, the methane QD rolled down Highway 4 and was installed overnight on the launch mount. Given the Oxygen QD was also fully outfitted, we may see it being installed soon. This week, teams also moved the hood for one of those QDs to the launch site. Right now it's been staged near the pad, but it may be installed soon if it's for the methane QD, since they already have the umbilicals installed. A similarly shaped hood will then be installed on the other QD, and both will also be outfitted with a door, just like the one on pad 1. Although, here's hoping they don't have as many issues as they had with that door. The doors for these QDs were at Sanchez when we flew over this week, so we'll be on standby for when they head out to the pad. Of course, at pad 2, not everything is about the launch mount. For example, SpaceX is now starting to dig a retention pond to the south of the mount. This correlates with the environmental paperwork for the pad that we saw in the last year, which indicated that this area would be for what it calls the, quote, flame diverter collection pond. We can also see that teams have begun laying down the pipes that connect the orbital tank farm with launch tower 2. These go up the tower and will eventually go into the ship's QD arm. Speaking of that arm, it still continues to be worked on at the Sanchez lot, and we're still waiting on when it might be moved to the pad and installed on tower 2 hopefully sooner rather than later. Next to the launch mount, we can also see the piles for the staging area where ship and transport stands park for the chopsticks to either lift or set down a ship or booster. This area is still missing its concrete slab at the top, but that pour may happen not too far from now. Further north, teams have also made progress on the blast wall that will protect the deluge tank farm from Starship launches just next door. From the ground, Caesar also took this shot of the top of the flame trench, which shows the ends of the ridge cap have been installed and hooked up. And if we move out to the tank farm area, we can see the clear comparison between the mess that is the side of the tank farm feeding pad 1 and the tidy and clean configuration of the side that feeds pad 2. Not a lot of work remains to complete the side of the tank farm for pad 2. There are still two cryo pumps missing, one on the methane side and another on the oxygen side, but it probably won't be long until those are installed. There are also still various lines that have not been connected yet to the pad 2 systems, so we'll have to see those connected as well before everything needed for a launch can flow out to the launch mount and tower at pad 2. Now, if this whole flyover thing sounds familiar to you, it's because we also do those at the Space Coast as well. Last week, we released our latest Space Coast update with lots of info about Starship, New Glenn, Stoke, and many others, so check that out if you haven't done so yet. In the time since that update, we've seen more work at the Starship launch pad being built at Launch Complex 39A. If there were already a bunch of cranes on site, this past week we saw a few more rising from the ground. It brings back memories from when we also had lots of cranes around Starbase working on a thousand different things. Wait, that's also happening now. Never mind. Most of the work seems to focus on the flame trench in front of the tower, but also on the back of the tower where we think the deluge tank farm will be for that site. Some of the crane work can be seen to the north as well, which may be for the propellant tank farm. This week, our Space Coast live cameras also spotted several little pipes headed to 39A, as well as a few trucks with large green pipes headed the same way. Those large green pipes look a lot like the ones used at Starbase for the deluge farm, so these are most likely water pipes for 39A. Whew! That was quite a week. It wouldn't surprise me if we left a bunch of stuff out. There's always so much going on at Starbase, but this week it was extra packed. And hopefully we'll get Ship 37 on the pad in the next few days. So stay tuned to our socials and stay alert with our Starbase Live 24-7 stream. Of course, we'll go live whenever Ship 37 rolls out to the pad and begins testing. Until then, thanks for watching and don't forget, be excellent to each other.